Hello again, this is Professor Khan. Uh, today I want to walk you through the slideshow about narrator point of view. Uh, for paper three, you're being asked to write about two new elements of fiction, setting and narrator point of view. Hopefully you've had a chance to study the setting slideshow and listen to the presentation. Now we're going to talk about narrator point of view. Once again, let me remind you, as you are working on paper three, take some time, go back and um, study the central idea slideshow and presentation. Take a look at the many samples of central idea statements that I, I've posted in module three. Uh, and definitely take a look at the cause and effect slideshow. That slideshow, you know, focuses on character. For paper three, you're going to want to compose cause and effect arguments linking setting and the narrator point of view choice to the central idea statement. So let's take a little bit of time and kind of walk through some of the fundamental concepts and terms and ideas surrounding narrator point of view that you'll want to be familiar with so that you can tackle paper three. First of all, let's just make sure we understand what we mean by the narrator. The narrator is the storyteller. It's the voice that reveals the story to the reader. Do not confuse the narrator with the author. In a certain sense, um, in formalism, the author doesn't exist. The author has made certain choices um, in composing the story, and we do want to examine those choices. But really, that's as far as it goes when it comes to our concern with a so-called author. The narrator is a fictional construct, just like the characters in the story, just like the plot of a story, the things that happen in the story. These are all fictions. These are all creations of the author. And sure, a narrator could uh, mimic an author's personality. It could reflect an author's sensibilities and language. Uh, but a narrator could be very, very different from an author as well. So we need to sort of separate the two in our mind. And we certainly don't want to make the mistake when we're writing about narrator point. We don't want to use the term the author, or the writer, and use those terms interchangeably. The narrator is a mechanism created by the author to tell the story. The point of view refers to the relative position of the narrator to the story that the narrator is telling. Uh, think of it as the perspective or the stance from which the narrator tells a story. If you can envision a narrator as occupying a particular sort of place in relation to the story, and that place gives the narrator certain abilities to view and you know relate what's going on, but that place, that point of view may also limit the narrator in terms of what the narrator can tell us uh, about the story. Now, this term point of view, which we abbreviate POV, uh, in this case, we're using it in a, you know, very specific way. We're, we're not, when we, when we use point of view as a, as a element of fiction, we're not referring to you know, someone's opinion or a bias, you know, like I might ask you, well, what's your what's your point of view about this whole coronavirus 
thing. You know, what's your point of view about the election? What's your point of view about gun control? What's your point of view about this, that, or the other thing? What's your opinion? What's your stance? That isn't what we're talking about here. It is true that a narrator might be biased, and we'll talk about that here shortly, but when we use the term point of view, we're not talking about someone's opinion. We're talking about the position that the narrator occupies in relationship to the story that the narrator is telling. And this will become more clear once we talk about the certain types of point of view. There are four types of point of view that we're gonna discuss. First person point of view, third person dramatic point of view, third person limited omniscient point of view, and third person full omniscient point of view. There are other points of view, and depending on the instructor or the professor, there might be different terms that they use to refer to these same types of points of view. But these are the, the terms that we're going to use. This is what we're going to limit ourselves to in terms of paper three. So all of the types of narrators, all of those, those four types of points of view have the ability to do the following. They have the ability to tell a story in any order. Uh, a story you know, is usually told chronologically but that's not always true. You know, we certainly see in Sonny's Blues that a story can be told somewhat out of order. Um, we can, you know, see in, in uh, other stories about how a narrator tells a story out of chronological order, plays with the time. Sometimes this is sort of a minor thing or minor part of the plot. Sometimes it's a pretty major piece of the plot. Uh, a narrator has the ability to conceal information as well as reveal information at will. So a great example of this is the lottery, Shirley Jackson's story, The Lottery. You know, if you had never heard of that story, you would never read it before. By the time you finish that story, that story ends in a much, much different place than it does uh, begin. Um, imagine if on in the first paragraph of that story, uh, the narrator told us that the lottery was a sacrificial ritual in which a townsperson was chosen by random or supposedly by random uh, and then ritually executed. Well, that would give away the surprise, right? The twist ending, and that's one of the joys of the story is that very dark twist at the end. That would be a totally different story. So the narrator, in a sense, has revealed certain information to us, but has also concealed certain information from us and lets that concealed information slowly become apparent as the story progresses. A narrator can tell the story in the moment, um, you know, the, 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 narr the narrator might be present as the story is unfolding. Uh, it could also be looking back on it from some sort of remove of time. So I mentioned in the setting presentation, uh, Sammy in A and P, you know, he's, he, he's an example of what we call a first person point of view narrator. He's a, he's a character in the story. And I'll get to the first person here shortly. Um, but he seems to be telling the story, you know, after some time has passed. He's sort of looking back on that event uh, that happened there at the A&P that, that day. And he's telling it from a, a future point in time because he does sort of offer some comments about, about what happened and, and, and some perspective, a little bit of perspective on that story. Uh, the story A, uh, Araby by James Joyce. Um, that's a really interesting story because the narrator, the, the, it's another first person story. The character is a young boy and yet the language he uses to tell the story is so 
adult. It seems so, um, so amazing, <laughs> so so artistic. Even uh, it's hard to imagine that a, a young boy, you know, having the ability to tell a story using that type of language. So it almost seems as if the narrator is actually an adult looking back on his youth and is sort of telling the story from that that remove of time the time between when the story occurred or when 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 the, when the events of the story occurred and some later point in time um story of an hour on the other hand you know the narrator third person narrator is very much there in the moment of the story as the story is unfolding finally narrators have the ability no matter what kind narrators have the ability to adopt any number of what we call tones of voice. So let's uh, dwell for a few moments on tone. In fiction, when we're talking about the elements of fiction, tone refers to the tone of voice of the narrator. We can't hear a character speak. We can't hear a narrator speak. Therefore, we might have a difficult time detecting the so-called tone of voice in the voice itself. So we've got to rely on language, language choices, as well as context, you know, what's going on at that moment in the story in order to detect what we call the tone or the tone of voice of a narrator. So I, I uh, am providing a couple of, I just call them tone cheat sheets, <laughs> uh, along with this presentation and this slideshow, they're in module three. And those sheets sort of explain tone a little bit more in depth and offer you a fairly lengthy list of adjectives that we might use to describe tone. But very quickly, let me show you this example. Uh, so if I said, so, you know, I, I got a I get a parking ticket one day and I'm telling you about it. And if I just say, well, the policeman gave me a parking ticket. Well, that's a very sort of objective, matter of fact tone. It's pretty emotionally neutral. If I just say it that way, the policeman gave me a parking ticket. If I say some board cop tagged me with another ticket. Well, if I were to say this out loud to you, you know, I might assume a certain tone of voice. I might say, some bored cop tagged me with another ticket. Well, if you're only reading this on the page and you, you can't hear the inflection in my voice, hopefully you can still detect that this is kind of a resentful tone and perhaps even a defiant tone. If I were to say to you out loud, someone had slipped the ticket under my windshield wiper like a blade slipped under rib. You know, that's, that's like masterpiece theater or something, right? It sounds very pretentious, very artsy and affected, right? The tone of voice that I, I tried to give off that line. Well, if you're not hearing anybody speak that line out loud, which of course you're not when you're reading a story. You just have to look at the language here. And that language is very sort of artsy and somewhat pretentious. I mean, I'm all for poetry, but you know, let's let's um let's use let's use our poetry when it counts. Not to not to simply relate that we got a parking ticket. I could say a citation for violation of parking had been affixed to my car. That's just an overly wordy, maybe formal, technical, um, grammatically overlong way of saying something very simple. So that seems to have a formal technical tone to it. You know, if I sort of yell out, I got another blah, 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 blank ticket. I have an angry tone of voice. You can detect that in the words, you know, written here on, on the slide. <sighs> another week goes by, another parking ticket stuck to the car. What else is new? So here it's like I've just sort of given up. I've just resigned to the fact that I am fated to get parking tickets in my life. 
and I'm a little exasperated by it as well. Well, that's the tone of voice I try to use when I said that out loud. But if you're reading a story, you're not going to hear those inflections of voice. You have to pick up on them based upon the language being used, as well as, you know, the context, what's happening here at this moment of the story. What, what are the characters like? What's the situation like? What's, what's the nature of the conflict and so on? So that's the tone. That's what we mean by tone, the tone of voice of the narrator. And, you know, th think about this. There, will, there is no story without the narrator. The narrator is the only way we are getting the story. There is no other way we are getting story other than the narrator. So every single word in a short story is being delivered by the narrator. Tone in a first person point of view, and we'll, we'll get to first and third persons here, here in a few minutes. But for now, let me say that in, in a first person point of view, tone is usually aligned or perhaps even identical with the main character emotion state. In a first person point of view, that means that the character is the narrator. In a third person point of view, this point of view is uh, a storyteller that is outside of the story, not a character in the story, but kind of a you know, almost disembodied voice that's looking in on the story. Uh, tone can help determine how subjective or objective the narrator is toward the characters and, and towards the story as a whole. And we'll talk about subjectivity and objectivity too here shortly. So again, just, just check out those cheat sheets that I've uh, included along with this slideshow there in module three for more about tone. All right, let's start talking about the four different types of point of view. First person. In first person point of view, like I said, the narrator is a character in the story. The narrator is within the realm of the story. And that narrator is usually the protagonist, although that's not always necessarily the case. It's usually the case. Could be a secondary character. It could be a group, could be sort of a plural uh, community. Uh, it could be a non-participating observer that still refers to itself as uh, in, in, in a first-person way. So, you know, we call it first-person because the narrator refers to itself using first-person pronouns. Uh, I, sometimes we, that's less common, but that does occur. If you detect that the narrator is a character in the story. The character refers to itself as an I uh, or less common a we, then what you've got is a first person narrator point of view. Now, once we determine that a narrator is a first person narrator, we need to ask ourselves, how reliable is this first person narrator? So a first person narrator is going to exist along a spectrum of reliability. It's going to be either more or less reliable, more or less unreliable. And this sort of reliability may change over the course of a story, just sort of depending. So what does that mean? What does reliability mean? Reliability refers to how honest the narrator is with us, how truthful the narrator is, um, how aware, how self-aware, how open the narrator is with us, the readers. Reliability is about how accurately the narrator is presenting itself as well as the story. So think of it this way. You know, all of us <laughs> as human beings, um, you know, it, day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, in our interactions with other people, we choose what 
we want to reveal to those people. We choose what we might conceal from those people. Um, we are sometimes open and truthful. Sometimes we lie. Sometimes we tell a little white lie, so to speak, you know, kind of a small lie. Sometimes we tell major lies. Um, and I think it's also fair to say that we hide things from ourselves. You know, we, no, nobody, nobody wants to be known as an ugly person, uh, an, an, an unpleasant person, uh, a person of low ethical and moral values, uh, usually. So we try to put our best face forward. And sometimes we try to fool ourselves, you know, oh, well, the reason why I did that terrible thing was because of this reason, when in fact, it was a totally different reason, but we kind of lie to ourselves and convince ourselves otherwise. So that's what reliability refers to. It refers to sort of how honest the, the first person narrator is with itself as well as with other characters and uh, at the end of the day with us, the readers. A first person narrator is really out of all four of these types of narrators, you know, it's, it's trying to capture the authentic human experience because the first person narrator is a character moving in the world of the story. So the, that first person narrator tries to sort of uh, mimic that human tendency to um, create, create, th create its own reality as it b sees fit to do. And that may mean that it's not always giving us a very honest appraisal of what's going on. Uh, reliability can also um, be affected by, you know, uh, other things like, uh, you know, if a character gets super drunk or if a character, um, you know, is, is uh, not present for certain events and simply doesn't know about them and then tries to relate, you know, what happened, you know, there's all sorts of other reasons why a character might be unreliable. Uh, perhaps the character is very young and doesn't have the wisdom needed to understand you know, the truth about what's going on. You know, there's an interesting debate that can crop up, you know, well, the character is revealing the truth honestly as it perceives it, but it's not really the truth of the matter. Well, does that mean that the narrator is reliable, but has a flawed understanding? Or does that mean the narrator is actually unreliable? Yeah, that's a, I think that's an interesting philosophical debate, and it's something you might come across uh, if you choose to write about a story that has a first-person narrator for, for paper three. So when we consider the types of narrators, one thing I like to do is think about what sort of powers that first person or that, that the type of point of view has, as well as what sort of limitations it has. Like I said, when I when I first brought up point of view, point of view is really all about the relative position of a narrator to the events of the story. And depending upon that position, there might be certain advantages to that position, there might be certain disadvantages. So generally speaking, generally speaking, a first person narrator has unfettered access to its own thoughts and feelings. You know, unless there's some, you know, medical condition or, you know, the character has been brainwashed or something, you know, the narrator is going to have access to its own feelings and thoughts and, and it can reveal those to us, the readers. It may misinterpret some of those things. It may not fully understand some of those things. Uh, and certainly there's the possibility of unconscious uh, urges and motivations that are driving the narrator character uh, that the character is not aware of. Uh, those are all possible possibilities, but generally speaking, you know, the narrator can be very open with us. I think Sonny's Blues is a really good example of that. That's a first person narrator that is um, spending really the entire story telling the reader what he thinks. 
and doing so in a, in a fairly upfront and honest way. Uh, first person narrators have the ability to view and interpret the actions of other characters. It can see what other characters do, listen to what other characters say, and then interpret those actions and those words accordingly. And a first person narrator point of view can provide exposition and backstory, including backstory, you know, as long as that information is within the realm of understanding of that narrator. If there's past history that the narrator doesn't know about, it can't reveal it to us. Certain limitations of the first person point of view. It does not have direct access to thoughts and feelings of others. Uh, you know, unless the, the, that first person narrator is psychic or something. Don't have any examples of that in this class, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but I suppose we could have a, I don't know, a mystery or a horror story or a science fiction story where the, the first person narrator has a, a mystical or magical or psychic ability to read the minds of others. Well, that's the exception to the rule. First person narrators don't have that type of access. All they can do is observe what other characters say and do and kind of judge what their thoughts and feelings are based on that. The other limitation is that the entire story, literally everything in the story is being revealed to us through the filter of that narrator's biases and limited understandings. Remember, the first person narrator is a character in the story, active in the story, involved in the conflict of the story usually. So that character, just like a human being, is going to have biases, it's going to have certain understandings, certain misunderstandings, limited understandings, and the story is being given to us through those various filters. So some examples of first person stories that we've read so far. Sunny's Blues, like I said before, <clears throat> Cathedral, Bub is the protagonist, he's also the narrator. Um, you know, he uh, knows quite a bit about the wife's backstory, but notice he never reveals anything about his own past. He's very reluctant to say anything to us, the readers, about himself. And ultimately, it's Robert who ends up pulling, you know, some bits of information about the, the narrator's life. You know, the narrator finally reveals that he's not happy with his job. Uh, he doesn't really know, you know, what else to do. So he's not looking for a new job. Uh, he's not a very religious or spiritual guy. Uh, you know, he's, he's in effect telling Robert that he's just not a very happy person. And, you know, he, that, that information is really being kind of pulled from him by Robert. The narrator himself is not revealing that to us. It's almost as if the narrator in Cathedral knows that he's kind of a schlub, <laughs> that he's kind of a loser. Um, and, you know, just doesn't want to admit it, doesn't want to face that fact. The lesson uh, is a, you know, fantastic example of the first person in action. Uh, Sylvia is such a vibrant, wonderful character. And of course, it's Bambara's uh, use of language that, that really makes that happen. You know, Sylvia is a wholly unique, uh, very fascinating character. Um, who, kind of like Bub, you know, uh, re refuses to or, or see certain things. Uh, but of course, she's got a much better excuse. You know, she's lived a uh, life, um, you know, within this, this neighborhood. She's not fully aware of the outside world. Uh, and of course, um, she's very young. Uh, A and P is a great example of a story that's first person narrator. Sammy is telling his own story and James Joyce 
uh, James Joyce's story, Araby. We, the narrator is unnamed, but he's the kind of young boy with the crush on the, the girl next door. And he seems to be, like I said before, very uh, precocious in a way, given the language that he uses to describe his, his story and his situation. But he seems to be very a very thoughtful narrator who's able to reveal himself fairly honestly to us. So uh, what I guess in a sense what I've been talking about here a little bit is subjectivity and objectivity. Um, the, the narrator in Sonny's Blues is is uh, very reliable. Um, we, you know, we trust what he has to say. Bub in Cathedral is somewhat reliable. He, he doesn't he doesn't reveal a lot to us, um, but reveals a lot about other characters. Uh, Sylvia, I think, is both reliable and unreliable. She's unreliable in the sense that she's, you know, just ignorant about certain things. And it's not her fault. That's just the way it is. But she certainly speaks her mind. She's honest about her thoughts. And that's certainly a, a sign of reliability. Uh, Sammy, I think, is also fairly reliable, and the narrator in Araby is quite reliable, too. All right, let's talk about third person. So we've got three different types of third person points of view. In third person point of view, the narrator is outside of the story. It's not a character in the story. It's not a, a person. It's sort of this mechanism or this, this disembodied voice kind of looking into the fishbowl of the story, right? So characters don't interact with the third person narrator. The third person narrator is quite literally outside of the story, simply storytelling, telling the story to us, the readers. Uh, a third person narrator is going to refer to characters using third person pronouns. You know, he, his, him, she, hers, her, they, their, them, etc. The narrator, third person narrator doesn't really refer to itself, although I have read stories where it will do that, but that's pretty uncommon <clears throat> because if it does, then it seems to suggest that it's a character in the story. And it's not. I will say that we do have stories using the second person point of view. We don't have any for uh, our class, for our assignment. Uh, second person point of view stories are kind of odd. It's where the narrator is referring to you using the, the pronoun you and your and yours and, and so on. And it's almost forcing the reader to be the main character in the story. So it's, it's a really sort of odd narratorial space to occupy. And I got to tell you, it's difficult to pull off. I've read more terrible second person stories than I've read good ones. And it really takes a talent, I think, to pull off a second person uh, narrator point of view. But you don't have to worry about that. We don't have any of those stories here in, in, uh, in our class this, this term. Third person narrators may be subjective or objective along a spectrum of possibility. And the subjectivity or objectivity of a third person narrator may change over the course of a story. Reliability, unreliability, that's really a first person point of view concern. When we talk about third person points of view, we really want to talk more about subjectivity and objectivity. A subjective third person narrator, they seem somewhat um, invested in the story. They seem concerned about the character, or at least a character. Uh, they seem concerned with the events of the story in some way. Now, that might manifest in a variety of ways. Uh, a narrator might, through the language it uses, indicate that it feels sort of a fondness for a character. 
uh, maybe feels some sympathy for a character or on the other end it might show a bit of dislike for a character or the events in the story or the settings or any number of other elements that make up a story so subjectivity refers to you know how how much the the narrator seems to like or feel sympathy for the characters or how much it maybe dislikes or doesn't feel sympathy for the characters as well as other elements plot things that occur secondary characters the conflict settings so on and so forth that's what we mean by subjectivity the narrator the third person narrator seems to have a certain bias as it is telling the story to us the readers on the other hand an objective third person narrator seems disinterested in the characters and, and the story the objective third person is just there to report the story it's just kind of punching in the clock and coming into work and doing its job to tell the story and then it leaves it's very matter of fact very straightforward it doesn't seem to really have much bias to it uh, so as examples uh, story of an hour that's a third person narrator that really seems to have sympathy for Louise Mallard I mean we we peer deep into Louise's mind and heart and her journey if you will that she takes in that story uh, is I think revealed with quite a measure of sympathy by the narrator I, I sort of get the sense that the narrator is in many ways sort of rooting for Louise and is, is looking out for her uh, in the lottery we have a narrator who <clears throat> paragraph to paragraph seems fairly objective it doesn't seem to side take sides it doesn't seem to show any sympathy or dislike of characters or the situation you know I mean the, the you know the practice of the lottery is just a totally horrifying thing at least to us whether it's that to the characters I think is one of the questions that's left unanswered but the narrator seems fairly unmoved <laughs> by the proceedings so I would call that a more objective third person type of, of narrator now the argument could be made that well the narrator chose to reveal information in a careful way and of course waited until the very end to do the sort of the twist um, dark Twilight Zone kind of ending so maybe that suggests that the narrator really is wanting to uh, give us a ride give us a real scare give us a freak out there at the end and that might signal some subjectivity that's again sort of a philosophical debate okay let's talk about the types of third person now third person dramatic <clears throat> The third person dramatic point of view is only able to reveal action and dialogue and certain levels of exposition. So I think the easiest way to grasp this type of third person narrator, the, the third person dramatic narrator, think of that narrator as a movie camera. It's a machine. Its job is to record and then project um, the story and it does so you know without comment it does so without much bias if any uh, it does so without being able to mystically or almost supernaturally enter the mind or the heart or the soul of a character and read a character's interior life 
it can only look at the exterior. It can only see what is being said, what is being done. And then, of course, that dramatic third person narrator might have certain levels of knowledge about backstory. Uh, it can observe setting and describe setting. You know, it can describe what characters look like. So it can give exposition as well, a certain level of exposition, depending upon how much it knows. So a third person dramatic point of view has the power, the ability to view and reveal actions, dialogue of characters. Uh, it has the ability to provide limited exposition, including backstory. But it's limited as well. It cannot access thoughts and feelings of characters. It can only relate what characters say and what they do. And of course, you know, when human beings act a certain way, it might reveal their thoughts or emotional state. You know, when a character says a thing and says it in a particular way, that might reveal um, the inner life of that character. Uh, so the narrator can reveal those things to us, but it won't necessarily comment on how that reflects the emotional state or what the character happens to be thinking at that time. Uh, that third person dramatic is kind of going to just leave that on the table and let the readers try to figure that out on our, on our own. There's little, if any, interpretation of these things. Uh, as a result, third person dramatic points of view tend to be objective. Now, I put that in the limitation uh, column, so to speak. It might be a strength. It really just depends on how you think. So like I said before, the, th the lottery, the, the third person narrator is pretty objective, it seems, in, in that story. The lottery is an example of a third person dramatic point of view. We don't ever have a passage where, you know, the narrator says, well, um, Mr. Graves thought blah, 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 uh, or Mr. Summers felt in his heart that blah, 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 blah. We never get any direct access to thoughts or feelings. Um, you know, Tess felt terrified as the villagers picked up the stones and started lobbing them at her head, blah, 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 blah. So we don't get direct access. We only get actions and quite a bit of dialogue in that story. And, you know, we need to ask ourselves as readers, what's the effect of that on us? You know, that, that really does um, give the story a certain mood, the setting a certain mood. Uh, there's a certain, you know, emotional quality to that story that is uh, imparted because of that choice of narrator. And, and think of it this way. I mean, if, if the narrator uh, did have the ability to go into the mind and hearts of, of readers or of, uh, of uh, not of readers, but of characters. Well, why then there would be no excuse. We, we would know very quickly in the story what was up with the lottery, right? We would know that the lottery is this sacrificial ritual. Well, the narrator wants to keep that from us. So the narrator has to be dramatic, has to refuse to reveal those things to us. It has to limit itself in a particular way. All right, third person limited omniscient point of view. This type of third person narrator, and again, it's third person, so it's outside of the story. It's not a character. Uh, in this type of point of view, the narrator is able to access the interior life of only one character, a single character. And that's usually, of course, going to be the protagonist. So the word omniscience means all seeing. A third person limited omniscient narrator can see, so to speak, see and know a character's thoughts and feelings 
but it's limited to only the one character. So limited omniscient is sort of an oxymoron. It's a bit contradictory. Well, if it's all seeing, how can it be limited? Well, that's the term. We'll just have to forgive them that. Limited to only one character, but that third person narrator has the ability to look inside the mind, the heart of that character. So that's one of its powers. It's able to view and reveal actions and dialogue, the external life of characters, just like the dramatic third person point of view, but it also has the added ability to perceive directly thoughts and emotions and reveal those to us, the readers. A third person limited omniscient point of view can also provide exposition, including backstory, that exposition and backstory might be more developed because it can peer into uh, the interior life of a character. And there is, I think, a greater latitude for subjectivity. So the narrator in the story of an hour is a limited omniscient third person narrator. It's going into Louise's mind throughout most of the story, frankly. Um, and I think as a result of that, that narrator is subjective in a, in a positive way toward Louise. A third person limited omniscient is limited. It can only access this interior life of a character, only one character, not in one. Um, and this access might be limited in some way. It might be biased depending upon the subjectivity factor involved. So those could be limitations. So some examples of the third person limited omniscient. Uh, I said the story of an hour a couple times already. Great simple example of the third person limited omniscient. Deep dive into Louise's psyche, her mind, her heart. Uh, and like I said before, uh, quite a, I think, subjective third person narrator as well. A good man is hard to find. The O'Connor story, fantastic story. The narrator uh, is able to get into the mind of the grandmother. You know, one example is is when you know she's she's managed to manipulate the kids into driving Bailey almost crazy uh, about trying to find this plantation house that has all of the secret treasure hidden in it, apparently. Um, and they turn down the road or whatever, and then all of a sudden. The grandmother realizes to her horror that this plantation house that she was thinking of uh, isn't even in in Georgia. It's in some it's in some other state. Um, so there's a moment where we get into the mind of the grandmother and we do that off and on in a good man is hard to find. Um, I think that narrator is not nearly as subjective as the narrator in the story of an hour. Uh, but I wouldn't call it objective either. I think the, the narrator does have some measure of sympathy for the grandmother, even though in many ways she's, she's fairly unsympathetic. I put Paul's case here and then I put a question mark. Um, it really sort of depends. Paul's case, you know, we focus in on Paul. He's the protagonist. We certainly get uh, his thoughts and his feelings, you know, throughout the story. But there are moments early in the story when we get the thoughts of other characters. And I'm thinking in particular about the teachers at the, the school meeting at the beginning of that story. You know, Paul is in trouble. So he goes to have a meeting with the teachers and the principal of the school. And there are a few bits in there where we get what we get the narrator reveals to us what teachers are thinking about Paul. Now, part of me is like, well, OK, that means that this narrator is not a limited omniscient, but rather a full omniscient third person narrator. And that's what we'll get to here in just a moment. But at the same time, I'm thinking, well, a lot of that stuff at the beginning is just position. So does it really count? Um, you know, I think it's, it's again, sort of a debate that we could have about whether or not Paul's case is an example of a limited or a full omniscient narrator. Let's talk about full next. 
in a third person full omniscient point of view the narrator is able to access the interior life of more than one character usually including the protagonist and, and usually focusing on the protagonist that just makes sense because the protagonist is the center of the story a third person fully omniscient narrator can see and know more than one character's thoughts and feelings this access may not occur consistently or throughout a story it may just happen you know briefly with, with a, another character and then we go back to focusing on the main protagonist character so we sort of have to watch out for that a fully omniscient third person narrator has the ability to view and reveal actions and dialogue that's the exterior but also the thoughts and emotions or the interior lives of multiple characters it can provide exposition including backstory just like all the other types of narrators it might have an expanded ability to do this based upon its ability to look into the the hearts and minds of multiple characters and again i think we've got quite a bit of latitude for subjectivity here that might expand to more than one character limitations it's possible that if this fully omniscient third person narrator is bouncing around between characters and giving us insight into the the interior lives of more than one character that there might be some compete some competition in terms of the focus uh, I don't think we necessarily have any examples of that in our crop of stories but it's a danger that it can occur um, and you know like the uh, limited omniscient point of view it has a limited or biased access depending upon its level of subjectivity or objectivity so I'll put Paul's case here with a question mark again um, it really just sort of depends on how you take the story's opening paragraphs whether or not we treat that as just backstory uh, or whether or not this is actual action that's occurring and I think it could be read either way uh, the Marquez story which we haven't really mentioned uh, in the slideshows thus far uh, the Marquez story a very old man with enormous wings I think is an example of a a fully omniscient story we get into the thoughts uh, at one point of the priest who's been called to town to try to figure out what's going on with this mysterious old man with enormous wings that has showed up at the village uh, later on we get into the thoughts and the feelings of the wife so at least two characters were given sort of internal access to so let me know uh, if you're struggling with point of view in the story you've chosen uh, the stories that I list in uh, paper three I chose those stories because they they run the spectrum of possibility here there's first person stories there's third person dramatic third person limited and third person full um, so depending upon which story you know you pick it will be one of those four uh, it is possible for points of view to change in a story uh, we don't have examples of that in the list so you don't really have to worry about that but it is possible for that to happen um, there's a really wonderful story unfortunately it's not in the fifth edition of our textbook otherwise I would have added it to the list it's a story you may have read it's by Catherine Ann Porter it's called the jilting of granny Weatherall," and it's a story about this old woman who's dying basically and her, her uh, family is gathering around her as she's on her deathbed and it's primarily a first person point of view but it slips into third person because the character is dying and just sort of becoming disasso disassociative um, and the story really captures I think the experience of dying in, a, in an incredible way now that's you no know, 
easy for me to say, what do I know about the experience of dying? But Porter herself had a near-death experience, and it really is reflected in that story. So get, get a hold of that story. You can look it up online if you'd like. Uh, but that's an example of a story where we have almost a shifting point of view off and on throughout the, the story. But back to my uh, original point, that is, if you're struggling with point of view, let me know. I can give you some assistance, give you some clues, give you some prompts that'll put you on the right path in terms of point of view.